Chapter 3a of John Quincy Adams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Geller. John Quincy Adams by John T. Morse. Chapter 3a. Chapter 3 In the House of Representatives. In September 1830, Mr. Adams notes in his diary a suggestion made to him that he might, if he wished, be elected to the National House of Representatives from the Plymouth District. The gentleman who threw out this tentative proposition remarked that, in his opinion, the acceptance of this position by an ex-president, quote, instead of degrading the individual, would elevate the representative character. Mr. Adams replied that he, quote, had in that respect no scruple whatever. No person could be degraded by serving the people as a representative in Congress, nor, in my opinion, would an ex-president of the United States be degraded by serving as a select man of his town, if elected thereto by the people." End quote. A few weeks later, his election was accomplished by a flattering vote, the poll showing him 1,817 votes out of 2,565, with only 373 for the next candidate. He continued thenceforth to represent this district until his death, a period of about sixteen years. During this time he was occasionally suggested as a candidate for the governorship of the state, but was always reluctant to stand. The feeling between the Freemasons and the Anti-Masons ran very high for several years, and once he was prevailed upon to allow his name to be used by the latter party. The result was that there was no election by the people and as he had been very loath to enter the contest in the beginning he insisted upon withdrawing from before the legislature we have now therefore only to pursue his career in the lower house of congress unfortunately but of obvious necessity it is possible to touch only upon the more salient points of this which was really by far the most striking and distinguished portion of his life to do more than this would involve an explanation of the politics of the country and the measures before Congress much more elaborate than would be possible in this volume. It will be necessary, therefore, to confine ourselves to drawing a picture of him in his character as the great combatant of Southern slavery. In the waging of this mighty conflict we shall see both his mind and his character developing in strength, even in these years of his old age, and his traits standing forth in bolder relief than ever before. In his place on the floor of the House of Representatives he was destined to appear a more impressive figure than in any of the higher positions which he had previously filled. There he was to do his greatest work, and to win a peculiar and distinctive glory, which takes him out of the general throng even of famous statesmen, and entitles his name to be remembered with an especial reverence. Adequately to sketch his achievements, and so to do his memory the honor which it deserves, would require a pen as eloquent as has been wielded by any writer of our language. I can only attempt a brief and insufficient narrative. In his conscientious way he was faithful and industrious to a rare degree. He was never absent and seldom late. He bore unflinchingly the burden of severe committee work, and shirked no toil on the plea of age or infirmity. He attended closely to all the business of the house, carefully formed his opinions on every question, never failed to vote except for cause, and always had a sufficient reason independent of party allegiance to sustain his vote. Living in the age of oratory, he earned the name of, quote, the old man eloquent, end quote. Yet he was not an orator in the sense in which Webster, Clay, and Calhoun were orators. He was not a rhetorician. He had neither grace of manner nor a fine presence, neither an imposing delivery nor even pleasing tones. On the contrary, he was exceptionally lacking in all these qualities. He was short, rotund, and bald. About the time when he entered Congress, complaints became frequent in his diary of weak and inflamed eyes, and soon these organs became so roomy that the water would trickle down his cheeks. A shaking of the hand grew upon him to such an extent that in time he had to use artificial assistance to steady it for writing. His voice was high, shrill, liable to break, piercing enough to make itself heard, but not agreeable. 
this hardly seems the picture of an orator nor was it to any charm of elocution that he owed his influence but rather to the fact that men soon learned that what he said was always well worth hearing when he entered congress he had been for much more than a third of a century zealously gathering knowledge in public affairs and during his career in that body every year swelled the already vast accumulation moreover listeners were always sure to get a bold and honest utterance and often pretty keen words from him and he never spoke to an inattentive audience or to a thin house whether pleased or incensed by what he said the representatives at least always listened to it he was by nature a hard fighter and by the circumstances of his course in congress this quality was stimulated to such a degree that parliamentary history does not show his equal as a gladiator his power of invective was extraordinary and he was untiring and merciless in his use of it theoretically he disapproved of sarcasm but practically he could not refrain from it men winced and cowered before his milder attacks became sometimes dumb sometimes furious with mad rage before his fiercer assaults such struggles evidently gave him pleasure and there was scarce a back in congress that did not at one time or another feel the score of his cutting lash though it was the southerners and the northern allies of southerners whom chiefly he singled out for torture he was irritable and quick to wrath he himself constantly speaks of the infirmity of his temper and in many conflicts his principal concern was to keep it in control his enemies often referred to it and twitted him with it of alliances he was careless and friendships he had almost none but in the creation of enemies he was terribly successful not so much at first but increasingly as years went on a state of ceaseless vigilant hostility became his normal condition from the time when he fairly entered upon the long struggle against slavery he enjoyed few peaceful days in the house but he seemed to thrive upon the warfare and to be never so well pleased as when he was bandying hot words with slaveholders and the northern supporters of slaveholders when the air of the house was thick with crimination and abuse he seemed to suck in fresh vigor and spirit from the hate-laden atmosphere when invective fell around him in showers he screamed back his retaliation with untiring rapidity and marvellous dexterity of aim no odds could appall him with his back set firm against a solid moral principle it was his joy to strike out at a multitude of foes they lost their heads as well as their tempers but in the extremest moments of excitement and anger mr adams's brain seemed to work with machine-like coolness and accuracy with flushed face streaming eyes animated gesticulation and cracking voice he always retained perfect mastery of all his intellectual faculties he thus became a terrible antagonist whom all feared yet fearing could not refrain from attacking so bitterly and incessantly did he choose to exert his wonderful power of exasperation few men could throw an opponent into wild blind fury with such speed and certainty as he could and he does not conceal the malicious gratification which such feats brought to him a leader of such fighting capacity so courageous with such a magazine of experience and information and with a character so irreproachable could have won brilliant victories in public life at the head of even a small band of devoted followers but mr adams never had and apparently never wanted followers other prominent public men were brought not only into collision but into comparison with their contemporaries but mr adams's individuality was so strong that he can be compared with no one it was not an individuality of genius nor to any remarkable extent of mental qualities but rather an individuality of character to this fact is probably to be attributed his peculiar solitariness men touch each other for purposes of attachment through their characters much more than through their minds but few men even in agreeing with mr adams felt themselves in sympathy with him occasionally conscience or invincible logic or even policy and self-interest might compel one or another politician to stand beside him in debate or in voting 
but no current of fellow-feeling ever passed between such temporary comrades and him. It was the cold connection of duty or of business. The first instinct of nearly every one was opposition towards him. Coalition might be forced by circumstances, but never came by volition. For the purpose of winning immediate success, this was, of course, a most unfortunate condition of relationships. Yet it had some compensations. It left such influence as Mr. Adams could exert by steadfastness and argument entirely unweakened by suspicion of hidden motives or personal ends. He had the weight and enjoyed the respect which a sincerity beyond distrust must always command in the long run. Of this we shall see some striking instances. One important limitation, however, belongs to this statement of solitariness. It was confined to his position in Congress. Outside of the city of Washington, great numbers of people, especially in New England, lent him a hearty support, and regarded him with friendship and admiration. These men had strong convictions and deep feelings, and their adherents counted for much. Moreover, their numbers steadily increased, and Mr. Adams saw that he was the leader in a cause which engaged the sound sense and the best feeling of the intelligent people of the country, and which was steadily gaining ground. Without such encouragement, it is doubtful whether even his persistence would have held out through so long and extreme a trial. The sense of human fellowship was needful to him. He could go without it in Congress, but he could not have gone without it altogether. Mr. Adams took his seat in the House as a member of the 22nd Congress in December 1831. He had been elected by the National Republican, afterward better known as the Whig Party, but one of his first acts was to declare that he would be bound by no partisan connection, but would in every matter act independently. This course he regarded as a, quote, duty imposed upon him by his peculiar position, end quote, in that he, quote, had spent the greatest portion of his life in the service of the whole nation, and had been honored with their highest trust, end quote. Many persons had predicted that he would find himself subjected to embarrassments and perhaps to humiliations by reason of his apparent descent in the scale of political dignities. He notes, however, that he encountered no annoyance on this score, but on the contrary, he was rather treated with an especial respect. He was made chairman of the Committee on Manufactures, a laborious as well as an important and honorable position at all times, and especially so at this juncture when the rebellious mutterings of South Carolina against the protective tariff were already to be heard rolling and swelling like portentous thunder from the fiery southern regions. He would have preferred to exchange this post for a place upon the Committee on Foreign Affairs, for whose business he felt more fitted, but he was told that in the impending crisis his ability, authority, and prestige were all likely to be needed in the place allotted to him to aid in the salvation of the country. The nullification chapter of our history cannot here be entered upon at length, and Mr. Adams's connection with it must be very shortly stated. At the first meeting of his committee he remarks, quote, A reduction of the duties upon many of the articles in this tariff was understood by all to be the object to be effected, end quote. And a little later he said that he should be disposed to give such aid as he could to any plan for this reduction which the Treasury Department should devise. Quote, he should certainly not consent to sacrifice the manufacturing interest, he said, but something of concession would be due from that interest to appease the discontents of the South. End quote. He was in a reasonable frame of mind, but unfortunately other people were rapidly ceasing to be reasonable. When Jackson's message of December 4, 1832, was promulgated, showing a disposition to do for South Carolina pretty much all that she demanded, Mr. Adams was bitterly indignant. The message, he said, quote, recommends a total change in the policy of the Union with reference to the bank, manufacturers, internal improvement, and the public lands. It goes to dissolve the Union into its original elements, and is in substance a complete surrender to the nullifiers of South Carolina, end quote. When somewhat later on the President lost his temper and flamed out in his famous proclamation to meet the nullification ordinance, he spoke in tones more pleasing to Mr. Adams. 
but the ultimate compromise which disposed of the temporary dissension without permanently settling the fundamental question of the constitutional right of nullification was extremely distasteful to him he was utterly opposed to the concessions which were made while south carolina still remained contumacious he was for compelling her to retire altogether from her rebellious position and to repeal her unconstitutional enactments wholly and unconditionally before one jot should be abated from the obnoxious duties when the bill for the modification of the tariff was under debate he moved to strike out all but the enacting clause and supported his motion in a long speech insisting that no tariff ought to pass until it was known quote, whether there was any measure by which a state could defeat the laws of the union end quote. in a minority report from his own committee he strongly censured the policy of the administration he was for meeting fighting out and determining at this crisis the whole doctrine of state rights and secession quote, one particle of compromise, end quote, he said, with what truth events have since shown clearly enough, would, quote, directly lead to the final and irretrievable dissolution of the Union, end quote. In his usual strong and thoroughgoing fashion, he was for persisting in the vigorous and spirited measures, the mere brief declaration of which, though so quickly receded from, won for Jackson a measure of credit greater than he deserved. Jackson was thrown into a great rage by the threats of South Carolina, and replied to them with the same prompt wrath with which he had sometimes resented insults from individuals. But in his cool inner mind he was in sympathy with the demands which the state preferred, and though undoubtedly he would have fought her had the dispute been forced to that pass, yet he was quite willing to make concessions, which were in fact in consonance with his own views as well as with hers, in order to avoid that sad conclusion. He was satisfied to have the instant emergency pass over in a manner rendered superficially creditable to himself by his outburst of temper, under cover of which he sacrificed the substantial matter of principle without a qualm. He shook his fist and shouted defiance in the face of the nullifiers while Mr. Clay smuggled a comfortable concession into their pockets. Jackson, notwithstanding his belligerent attitude, did all he could to help Clay and was well pleased with the result. Mr. Adams was not. He watched the disingenuous game with disgust. It is certain that if he had still been in the White House, the matter would have had a very different ending, bloodier it may be, and more painful, but much more conclusive. For the most part Mr. Adams found himself in opposition to President Jackson's administration. This was not attributable to any sense of personal hostility towards a successful rival, but to an inevitable antipathy towards the measures, methods, and ways adopted by the general so unfortunately transferred to civil life. Few intelligent persons, and none having the statesman habit of mind, befriended the reckless, violent, eminently unstatesmanlike president. His ultimate weakness in the nullification matter, his opposition to internal improvements, his policy of sacrificing the public lands to individual speculators, his warfare against the Bank of the United States, conducted by methods the most unjustifiable the transaction of the removal of the deposit so disreputable and injurious in all its details, the importation of Mrs. Eaton's visiting list into the politics and government of the country, the dismissal of the oldest and best public servants as a part of the nefarious system of using public offices as rewards for political aid and personal adherence, the formation from base ingredients of the ignoble, quote, kitchen cabinet, end quote. All these doings, together with much more of the like sort, constituted a career which could only seem blundering, undignified, and dishonorable in the eyes of a man like Mr. Adams, who regarded statesmanship with the reverence due to the noblest of human callings. Right as Mr. Adams was generally in his opposition to Jackson, yet once he deserves credit for the contrary course. This was in the matter of our relations with France. The Treaty of 1831 secured to this country an indemnity of $5 million, which, however, it had never been possible to collect. This procrastination raised Jackson's ever-ready ire, and casting to the winds any further dunning, he resolved either to have the money or to fight for it. 
he sent a message to Congress recommending that if France should not promptly settle at the account, letters of mark and reprisal against her commerce should be issued. He ordered Edward Livingston, minister at Paris, to demand his passports and cross over to London. These eminently proper and ultimately effectual measures alarmed the large party of the timid, and the general found himself in danger of extensive desertions even on the part of his usual supporters. But as once before in a season of his dire extremity his courage and vigour had brought the potent aid of Mr. Adams to his side, so now again he came under a heavy debt of gratitude to the same champion. Mr. Adams stood by him with generous gallantry, and by a telling speech in the house probably saved him from serious humiliation, and even disaster. The President's style of dealing had roused Mr. Adams's spirit, and he spoke with a fire and vehemence which accomplished the unusual feat of changing the predisposed minds of men too familiar with speech-making to be often much influenced by it in the practical matter of voting. He thought at the time that the success of this speech, brilliant as it appeared, was not unlikely to result in his political ruin. Jackson would befriend and reward his thoroughgoing partisans at any cost to his own conscience or the public welfare, but the exceptional aid tendered not from a sense of personal fealty to himself, but simply from the motive of aiding the right cause happening in the especial instance to have been espoused by him, never won from him any token of regard. In November 1837, Mr. Adams, speaking of his personal relations with the President, said, quote, Though I have served him more than any other living man ever did, and though I supported his administration at the hazard of my own political destruction, and effected for him at a moment when his own friends were deserting him what no other member of Congress ever accomplished for him, an unanimous vote of the House of Representatives to support him in his quarrel with France, though I supported him in other very critical periods of his administration, my return from him was insult, indignity, and slander. End quote. Antipathy had at last become the definitive condition of these two men, antipathy both political and personal. At one time a singular effort to reconcile them, probably, though not certainly, undertaken with the knowledge of Jackson, was made by Richard M. Johnson. This occurred shortly before the inauguration of the war conducted by the President against the Bank of the United States, and judging by the rest of Jackson's behavior at this period, there was probably at least as much of calculation in his motives, if in fact he was cognizant of Johnson's approaches, as there was of any real desire to re-establish the bygone relation of honorable friendship. To the advances thus made, Mr. Adams replied a little coldly, not quite repellently, that Jackson, having been responsible for the suspension of personal intercourse, must now be undisguisedly the active party in renewing it. At the same time, he professed himself, quote, willing to receive in a spirit of conciliation any advance which in that spirit General Jackson might make, end quote. But nothing came of this intrinsically hopeless attempt. On the contrary, the two drew rapidly and more widely apart, and entertained concerning each other opinions which grew steadily more unfavorable, and upon Adams's part more contemptuous, as time went on. Fifteen months later, General Jackson made his visit to Boston, and it was proposed that Harvard College should confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Laws. The absurdity of the act, considered simply in itself, was admitted by all, but the argument in its favor was based upon the established usage of the college as towards all other presidents, so that its omission in this case might seem a personal slight. Mr. Adams, being at the time a member of the Board of Overseers, strongly opposed the proposition, but of course in vain. All that he could do was, for his own individual part, to refuse to be present at the conferring of the degree giving as the minor reason for his absence that he could hold no friendly intercourse with the president, but for the major reason that, quote, independent of that, as myself an affectionate child of our alma mater, I would not be present to witness her disgrace in conferring her highest literary honors upon a barbarian who could not write a sentence of grammar and hardly could spell his own name, end quote. 
quote, a doctorate of laws, end quote, he said, quote, for which an apology was necessary, was a cheap honor and a sycophantic compliment. After the deed was done, he used to amuse himself by speaking of Dr. Andrew Jackson. This same eastern tour of Jackson's called forth many other expressions of bitter sarcasm from Adams. The president was ill and unable to carry out the program of entertainment and exhibition prepared for him, whereupon Mr. Adams remarks, quote, I believe much of his debility is politic. He is one of our tribe of great men who turn disease into commodity, like John Randolph, who for forty years was always dying. Jackson, ever since he became a mark of public attention, has been doing the same thing. He is now alternately giving out his chronic diarrhea and making Warren bleed for him a pleurisy and posting to Cambridge for a doctorate of laws, mounting the monument of Bunker's Hill to hear a fulsome address and receive two cannonballs from Edward Everett, etc. Quote, four-fifths of his sickness is trickery, and the other fifth mere fatigue, end quote. This sounds, it must be confessed, a trifle rancorous. But Adams had great excuse for nourishing rancor towards Jackson. End of chapter 3a. Recording by Tom Geller, Oberlin, Ohio. TomGeller.com Chapter 3b of John Quincy Adams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Smith. John Quincy Adams by John T. Morse. Chapter 3b. It is time, however, to return to the House of Representatives. It was not by bearing his share in the ordinary work of that body important or exciting as that might at one time or another happen to be that mr adams was to win in congress that reputation which has been already described as far overshadowing all his previous career a special task and a peculiar mission were before him it was a part of his destiny to become the champion of the anti-slavery cause in the national legislature almost the first thing which he did after he had taken his seat in congress was to present fifteen petitions signed numerously by citizens of pennsylvania praying for the abolition of slavery and the slave trade in the district of columbia he simply moved their reference to the committee on the district of columbia declaring that he should not support that part of the petition which prayed for abolition in the district the time had not yet come when the South felt much anxiety at such manifestations, and these first stones were dropped into the pool without stirring a ripple on the surface. For about four years more we hear little in the diary concerning slavery. It was not until 1835, when the annexation of Texas began to be mooted, that the North fairly took the alarm and the irrepressible conflict began to develop. Then at once we find Mr. Adams at the front that he had always cherished an abhorrence of slavery and a bitter antipathy to slaveholders as a class is sufficiently indicated by many chance remarks scattered through his diary from early years now that a great question virtually affecting the slave power divided the country into parts and inaugurated the struggle which never again slept until it was settled forever by the result of the civil war mr adams at once assumed the function of leader his position should be clearly understood, for in the vast labor which lay before the abolition party, different tasks fell to different men. Mr. Adams assumed to be neither an agitator nor a reformer. By necessity of character, training, fitness, and official position, he was a legislature and a statesman. The task which accident or destiny allotted to him was neither to preach among the people a crusade against slavery nor to devise and keep in action the thousand resources which busy men throughout the country were constantly multiplying for the purpose of spreading and increasing a popular hostility towards the great institution. Every great cause has need of its fanatics, its vanguard to keep far in advance of what is for the time reasonable and possible, 
it is not less need of the wiser and cooler heads to discipline and control the great mass which is set in motion by the reckless forerunners to see to the accomplishment of that which the present circumstances and development of the movement allow to be accomplished it fell to mr adams to direct the assault against the outworks which were then vulnerable and to see the force then possessed by the movement was put to such uses as would ensure definite results instead of being wasted in endeavors which as yet were impossible of achievement drawing his duty from his situation and surroundings he left to others to younger men and more rhetorical natures outside the walls of congress the business of firing the people and stirring popular opinion and sympathy he was set to do that portion of the work of abolition which was to be done in congress to encounter the mighty efforts which were made to stifle the great humanitarian cry in the halls of the national legislature this was quite as much as one man was equal to in fact it is certain that no one then in public life except mr adams could have done it effectually so obvious is this that one cannot help wondering what would have befallen the cause had he not been just where he was to forward it in just the way that he did it is only another among the many instances of the need surely finding the man his qualifications were unique his ability his knowledge his prestige and authority his high personal character his persistence and courage his combativeness stimulated by an acrimonious temper but checked by a sound judgment his merciless power of invective his independence and carelessness of applause or vilification friendship or in enmity constituted him an opponent fully equal to the enormous odds which the slaveholdering interest arrayed against him a like moral and mental fitness was to be found in no one else numbers could not overawe him nor loneliness dispirit him he was probably the most formidable fighter in debate of whom parliamentary records preserve the memory the hostility which he encountered be beggars description the english language was deficient in inadequate words of virulence and contempt to express the feelings which were entertained towards him at home he had not the countenance of that class in society to which he naturally belonged a second time he found the chief part of the gentlemen of boston and its vicinity the leading lawyers the rich merchants the successful manufacturers not only opposed to him but entertaining towards him sentiments of personal dislike and even vindictiveness the stratum of the community having a natural distaste for disquieting agitation and influenced by class feeling the gentlemen of the north sympathizing with the aristocracy of the south could not make common cause with anti-slavery people fortunately however mr adams was returned by a country district where the old puritan instincts were still strong the intelligence and free spirit of new england were at his back and were fairly represented by him in spite of high-bred disfavor they carried him gallantly through the long struggle the people of the plymouth district sent him back to the house every two years from the time of his first election to the year of his death and the disgust of the gentlemen of boston was after all of trifling consequence to him and of no serious influence upon the course of history the old new england instincts was in him as it was in the mass of the people that instinct made him the real exponent of new england thought belief and feeling and that same instinct made the great body of voters stand by him with unswavering consistency when his fellow representatives almost to a man deserted him he was sustained by many a token of sympathy and admiration coming from among the people at large time and the history of the united states have been his potent vindicators the conservative consciousness respectability of wealth was as is usually the case with it in the annals of the anglo-saxon race quite in the wrong and predestined to well-merited defeat it adds to the honor due to mr adams that his sense of right was true enough and that his vision was clear enough to lead him out of that strong thraldom 
which class feelings, traditions, and comradeship are wont to exercise. But it is time to resume the narrative and to let Mr. Adams' acts of which, after all, it is possible to give only the briefest sketch, selecting a few of the more striking incidents, tell the tale of his congressional life. On February 14, 1835, Mr. Adams again presented two petitions for the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, but without giving rise to much excitement. The fusillade was, however, getting too thick and fast to be endured longer with the indifference by impatient sub Southerners. At the next session of Congress, they concluded to try to stop it, and their ingenious scheme was to make Congress shotproof, so to speak, against such missiles. On January 4, 1836, Mr. Adams presented an abolition petition couched in the usual form and moved that it be laid on the table as others like it had lately been. But in a moment, Mr. Glasscock of Georgia moved that the petition be not received. Debate sprang up on a point of order, and two days later, before the question of reception was determined, a resolution was offered by Mr. Jarvis of Maine, declaring that the House would not entertain any petitions for the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia. This resolution was supported on the ground that Congress had no constitutional power in the premises. Some days later, January 18th, 1836, before any final action had been reached upon this proposition, Mr. Adams presented some more abolition petitions, one of them signed by 148 ladies, citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. For I said I had not yet brought myself to doubt whether females were citizens. The usual motion not to receive was made, and then a new device was resorted to in the shape of a motion that the motion not to receive be laid on the table. On February 8, 1836, this novel scheme for shutting off petitions against slavery immediately upon their presentation was referred to a select committee of which Mr. Pinckney was chairman. On May 18th, this committee reported in substance, one, that Congress had no power to interfere with slavery in any state, two, that Congress ought not to interfere with slavery in the District of Columbia, and three, that whereas the agitation of the subject was disquieting and objectionable, all petitions, memorials, memorials, resolutions, or papers relating in any way to or to any extent whatsoever to the subject of slavery or the abolition of slavery, shall, without being either printed or referred, be laid upon the table, and that no further action, whatever shall be had, thereon. When it came to taking a vote upon this report, a division of the question was called for, and the yeas and nays were ordered. The first resolution was then read, whereupon Mr. Adams at once rose and pledged himself, if the house would allow him five minutes time to prove it to be false but cries of order resounded he was compelled to take his seat and the resolution was adopted by one hundred and eighty two to nine upon the second resolution he asked to be excused from voting and his name was passed in the call the third resolution with its preamble was then read and mr adams so soon as his name was called rose and said i hold the resolution to be a direct violation of the Constitution of the United States. The rules of this House and the rights of my constituents, he was interrupted by shrieks of order resounding on every side. But he only spoke the louder and obstinately finished his sentence before resuming his seat. The resolution was, of course, agreed to, the vote standing 117 to 68. Such was the beginning of the famous gag, which became and long remained afterward in a worse shape a standing rule of the house regularly in each new congress when the adoption of rules came up mr adams moved to rescind the gag but for many years his motions continued to be voted down as a matter of course its imposition was clearly a mistake on the part of the slave-holding party free debate would almost certainly surely have hurt them less than this interference with the freedom of petition they had assumed an intendable position. Henceforth, as a persistent advocate of the right of his petition, Mr. Adams had a support among the people at large vastly greater than he could have enjoyed as the opponent of slavery. As his adversaries had shaped the issue, he was predestined to victory in a free country. 
A similar scene was enacted on December 21st and 22nd, 1837. A gag or speech smothering resolution being then again before the house mr adams with his name was called in the taking of the vote cried out amidst a perfect war whoop of order i hold the resolution to be a violation of the constitution of the right of petition of my constituents and of the people of the united states and of my right to freedom of speech as a member of this house afterward in reading over the names of members who had voted the clerk omitted that of mr adams this utterance of his have not having constituted a vote mr adams called attention to the omission the clerk by direction of the speaker thereupon called his name his only reply was by a motion that his answer as already made should be entered on the journal the speaker said that this motion was not in order mr adams resolute to get upon the record requested that this motion with his the speaker's decision that it was not in order might be entered on the journal the next day finding that the entry had not been made in proper shape he brought up the matter again one of his opponents made a false step and mr adams bantered him upon it until the other was provoked into saying that if the question ever came to the issue of war the southern people would march into new england and conquer it mr adams replied that no doubt they would if they could that he entered his resolution upon the journal because he was resolved that his opponent's name should go down to posterity damned to everlasting fame no one ever gained much in a war of words with his ever ready and merciless tongue mr adams having soon became known to all the nation as the indomitable presenter of anti-slavery petitions quickly found that great numbers of people were ready to keep him busy in this tying task for a while it was almost as much as he could accomplish to receive sort schedule and present the infinite number of petitions and memorials which came to him praying for the abolition of slavery and of the slave trade in the district of columbia and opposing the annexation of texas it was an occupation not altogether devoid even of physical danger and calling for an amount of moral courage greater than it is now easy to appreciate it is the incipient stage of such a conflict that tests the mettle of the little band of innovators when it grows into a great party question much less courage is demanded the mere presentation of an odious petition may seem in itself to be a simple task but to find himself in a constant state of antagonism to a powerful active and vindictive majority in a debating body constituted of such material as them made up the house of representatives were hardly even upon the iron temper and inflexible disposition of mr adams the most insignificant error of conduct in me at this time he writes in april eighteen thirty seven would be my irredeemable ruin in this world and both the ruling political parties are watching with intense anxiety for some overt act by me to set the whole pack of their hireling presses upon me but amid the host of foes and aware that he could count upon the aid of scarcely a single hearty and daring friend he labored only the more earnestly the severe pressure against him begot only the more severe counter pressure upon his part besides these natural and legitimate difficulties mr adams was further in the embarrassing position of one who has to fear as much from the imprudence of allies as from open hostility of antagonists and he was often compelled to guard against a peculiar risk coming from his very coadjutors in the great cause the extremists who had cast aside all regard for what was practicable and who utterly scorned to consider the feasibility or the consequences of measures which seemed to them to be correct as abstract propositions of morality were constantly urging him to action which would only have destroyed him further in political life would have stripped him of his influence exiled him from the position in congress where he could render the most efficient service that was in him and left him naked of all usefulness and utterly helpless to continue that essential portion of the labor which could be conducted by no one else the abolitionists generally he said are consistently urging me to indiscreet movements which would ruin me and weaken and not strengthen their cause 
His family, on the other hand, sought to restrain him from all connection with these dangerous partisans. Between these adverse impulses, he writes, my mind is agitated almost to distraction. I walk on the edge of a precipice almost every step that I take in the midst of all this anxiety. However, he was fortunately supported by the strong commendation of his constituents, which they once loyally declared by former and unanimous votes in a conviction summoned for the express purpose of manifesting their support. His feelings appear by an entry in his diary in October 1837. I have gone, he said, as far upon this article, the abolition of slavery, as the public opinion of the free portion of the Union will bear. And so far that scarcely a slave-holding member of the House dares to vote with me upon any question. I have as yet been thoroughly sustained by my own state, but one step further, and I hazard my own standing and influence there. My own final overthrow, and the cause of liberty itself for an indefinite time, certainly for more than my remnant of life. Were there in the House one member capable of taking the lead in the, this cause of universal emancipation, which is moving onward in the world and in this country, I would withdraw from the contest which will rage with increasing fury as it draws to its crisis. But for the management of which my age, infirmities, and approaching end totally disqualify me, there is no such man in the house. September 15, 1837. He says, I have been for some time occupied day and night when at home in assorting and recording the petitions and remonstrances against the annexation of Texas and other anti-slavery petitions which flow upon me in torrents. The next day he presented the singular petition of one Sherlock S. Gregory, who had conceived the eccentric notion of asking Congress to declare him an alien or stranger in the land so long as slavery exists and the wrongs of the Indians are unrequited and unrepented of. September 28th. He presented a batch of his usual petitions and also asked leave to offer a resolution calling for a report concerning the coasting trade in slaves. There was what Napoleon would have called a superb no. Return to my request from the servile side of the house. The next day he presented 51 more like documents and notes having previously presented 150 more. In December 1837, still at this same work, he made a hard but fruitless effort to have the Texan remonstrances and petitions sent to a select committee instead of to that on foreign affairs which was constituted in the southern interest. On December 29, he presented several bundles of abolition and anti-slavery petitions and said that having declared his opinion that the gag rule was unconstitutional, null, and void, he should submit to it only as to physical force. January 3, 1838, he presented about a hundred petitions, memorials, and remonstrances all laid on the table. January 15, he presented 50 more. January 28, he received 31 petitions and spent that day and the next in assorting and filing these and others which he previously had, amounting in all to 120. February 14th in the same year was a field day in the petition campaign. He presented then no less than 350 petitions, all but three or four of which bore more or less directly upon the slavery question. Among these petitions was one praying that Congress would take measures to protect citizens from the North going to the South from danger to their lives. When the motion to lay that on the table was made, I said that, in another part of the capital, it had been threatened that if a northern abolitionist should go to North Carolina and utter a principle of the Declaration of Independence, here a loud cry of order, order, burst forth in which the speaker yelled the loudest. I waited till it subsided, and then resumed, that if they could catch him, they would hang him. I said this so as to be distinctly heard throughout the hall. The renewed deafening shout of order order notwithstanding the speaker then said the gentleman from massachusetts will take his seat which i did and immediately rose again and presented another petition he did not dare tell me that i could not proceed without permission of the house and i proceeded the threat to hang northern abolitionists 
was uttered by Preston of the Senate within the last fortnight. End of chapter 3b Recording by John Smith Chapter 3c of John Quincy Adams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Geller. John Quincy Adams by John T. Morse. Chapter 3C. On March 12 of the same year, he presented 96 petitions, nearly all of an anti-slavery character, one of them for, quote, expunging the Declaration of Independence from the journals, end quote. On December 14, 1838, Mr. Wise of Virginia objected to the reception of certain anti-slavery petitions. The Speaker ruled his objection out of order, and from this ruling Wise appealed. The question on the appeal was taken by yeas and nays. When Mr. Adams's name was called, he relates, quote, I rose and said, Mr. Speaker, considering all the resolutions introduced by the gentleman from New Hampshire as, the Speaker roared out, the gentleman from Massachusetts must answer A or nay, and nothing else. Order! With a reinforced voice, I refuse to answer, because I consider all the proceedings of the House as unconstitutional. While in a firm and swelling voice I pronounced distinctly these words, the Speaker and about two-thirds of the House cried, Order! 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 till it became a perfect yell. I paused for a moment for it to cease, and then said, A direct violation of the Constitution of the United States. While speaking these words with loud, distinct, and slow articulation, the ball of order, order, resounded again from two-thirds of the house. The speaker, with agonizing lungs, screamed, I call upon the house to support me in the execution of my duty. I then coolly resumed my seat. Waddy Thompson of South Carolina, advancing into one of the aisles with a sarcastic smile and silvery tone of voice, said, What aid from the House would the Speaker desire? The Speaker snarled back, The gentleman from South Carolina is out of order, and a peal of laughter burst forth from all sides of the House. End quote. So that little skirmish ended much more cheerfully than was often the case. December 20, 1838, he presented fifty anti-slavery petitions, among which there were three praying for the recognition of the Republic of Haiti. Petitions of this latter kind he strenuously insisted should be referred to a select committee, or else to the Committee on Foreign Affairs, accompanied in the latter case with explicit instructions that a report thereon should be brought in. He audaciously stated that he asked for these instructions because so many petitions of a like tenor had been sent to the Foreign Affairs Committee, and had found it a limbo from which they never again emerged, and the chairman had said that this would continue to be the case. The chairman, sitting two rows behind Mr. Adams, said, quote, That insinuation should not be made against a gentleman. I shall make, retorted Mr. Adams, what insinuation I please. This is not an insinuation, but a direct, positive assertion. January 7, 1839, he cheerfully records that he presented 95 petitions bearing, quote, directly or indirectly upon the slavery topics, end quote, and some of them very exasperating in their language. March 30, 1840, he handed in no less than 511 petitions, many of which were not receivable under the, quote, gag, end quote, rule adopted on January 28 of that year, which had actually gone the length of refusing so much as a reception to abolition petitions. April 13, 1840, he presented a petition for the repeal of the laws in the District of Columbia, which authorized the whipping of women. Besides this, he had a multitude of others, and he only got through the presentation of them, quote, just as the morning hour expired, end quote. On January 21, 1841, he found much amusement in puzzling his southern adversaries by presenting some petitions in which, besides the usual anti-slavery prayers, there was a prayer to refuse to admit to the Union any new state whose constitution should tolerate slavery. The speaker said that only the latter prayer could be received under the gag rule. 
connor of north carolina moved to lay on the table so much of the petition as could be received mr adams tauntingly suggested that in order to do this it would be necessary to mutilate the document by cutting it into two pieces whereat there was great wrath and confusion quote, the house got into a snarl the speaker knew not what to do end quote. the southerners raved and fumed for a while and finally resorted to their usual expedient and dropped altogether the matter which so sorely burned their fingers a fact very striking in view of the subsequent course of events concerning mr adams's relation with the slavery question seems hitherto to have escaped the attention of those who have dealt with his career it may as well find a place here as elsewhere in a narrative which it is difficult to make strictly chronological apparently he was the first to declare the doctrine that the abolition of slavery could be lawfully accomplished by the exercise of the war powers of the government the earliest expression of this principle is found in a speech made by him in may eighteen thirty six concerning the distribution of rations to fugitives from indian hostilities in alabama and georgia he then said quote, from the instant that your slave-holding states become the theatre of war civil servile or foreign from that instant the war powers of the constitution extend to interference with the institution of slavery in every way in which it can be interfered with from a claim of indemnity for slaves taken or destroyed to a cession of the state burdened with slavery to a foreign power End quote. in june eighteen forty one he made a speech of which no report exists but the contents of which may be in part learned from the replies and references to it which are on record therein he appears to have declared that slavery could be abolished in the exercise of the treaty-making power having reference doubtless to a treaty concluding a war these views were of course mere abstract expressions of opinion as to the constitutionality of measures the real occurrence of which was anticipated by nobody but as the first suggestions of a doctrine in itself most obnoxious to the southern theory and fundamentally destructive of the great southern institution under perfectly possible circumstances this enunciation by mr adams gave rise to much indignation instead of allowing the imperfectly formulated principle to lose its danger in oblivion the southerners assailed it with vehemence they taunted mr adams with the opinion as if merely to say that he held it was to damn him to everlasting infamy the only result was that they induced him to consider the matter more fully and to express his belief more deliberately in january eighteen forty two mr wise attacked him upon this ground and a month later marshall followed in the same strain these assaults were perhaps the direct incentive to what was said soon after by mr adams on april fourteenth eighteen forty two in a speech concerning war with england and with mexico of which there was then some talk giddings among other resolutions had introduced one to the effect that the slave states had the exclusive right to be consulted on the subject of slavery mr adams said that he could not give his assent to this one of the laws of war he said is quote, that when a country is invaded and two hostile armies are set in martial array the commanders of both armies have power to emancipate all the slaves in the invaded territory end quote. he cited some precedents from south american history and continued quote, whether the war be servile civil or foreign i lay this down as the law of nations i say that the military authority takes for the time the place of all municipal institutions slavery among the rest under that state of things so far from its being true that the states where slavery exists have the exclusive management of the subject not only the president of the united states but the commander of the army has power to order the universal emancipation of the slaves end quote. this declaration of constitutional doctrine was made with much positiveness and emphasis there for many years the matter rested the principle had been clearly asserted by mr adams angrily repudiated by the south and in the absence of the occasion of war there was nothing more to be done in the matter but when the exigency at last came and the government of the united states was brought face to face with by far the gravest constitutional problem presented by the great rebellion then no other solution presented itself save that which had been suggested twenty years earlier in the days of peace by mr adams 
It was in pursuance of this doctrine to which he thus gave the first utterance that slavery was forever abolished in the United States. Extracts from that last quoted speech long stood as the motto of the, quote, liberator, end quote. And at the time of the Emancipation Proclamation, Mr. Adams was regarded as the chief and sufficient authority for an act so momentous in its effect, so infinitely useful in a matter of national extremity. But it was evidently a theory which had taken strong hold upon him. Besides the foregoing speeches, there is an explicit statement of it in a letter which he wrote from Washington, April 4, 1836, to Honorable Solomon Lincoln of Hingham, a friend and constituent. After touching upon other topics, he says, quote, The new pretensions of the slave representation in Congress of a right to refuse to receive petitions, and that Congress have no constitutional power to abolish slavery or the slave trade in the District of Columbia, forced upon me so much of the discussion as I did take upon me, but in which, you are well aware, I did not and could not speak a tenth part of my mind. I did not, for example, start the question whether by the law of God and of nature man can hold property, hereditary property, in man. I did not start the question whether in the event of a servile insurrection and war, Congress would not have complete and unlimited control over the whole subject of slavery, even to the emancipation of all the slaves in the state where such insurrection should break out and for the suppression of which the freemen of Plymouth and Norfolk counties, Massachusetts, should be called by acts of Congress to pour out their treasures and to shed their blood. Had I spoken my mind on these two points, the sturdiest of the abolitionists would have disavowed the sentiments of their champion. End quote. The projected annexation of Texas, which became a battleground whereon the tide of conflict swayed so long and so fiercely to and fro, profoundly stirred Mr. Adams's indignation. It is, he said, quote, a question of far deeper root and more overshadowing branches than any or all others that now agitate this country. I had opened it by my speech on the 25th May, 1836, by far the most noted speech that I ever made, End quote. He based his opposition to the annexation upon constitutional objections, and on September 18, 1837, offered a resolution that, quote, the power of annexing the people of any independent state to this union is a power not delegated by the Constitution of the United States to their Congress or to any department of their government, but reserved to the people, end quote. The Speaker refused to receive the motion, or even allow it to be read on the ground that it was not in order. Mr. Adams repeated substantially the same motion in June 1838, then adding, quote, that any attempt by act of Congress or by treaty to annex the Republic of Texas to this union would be a usurpation of power, which it would be the right and duty of the free people of the union to resist and annul, end quote. The story of his opposition to this measure is, however, so interwoven with his general antagonism to slavery that there is little occasion for treating them separately. Footnote 9. In an address to his constituents in September 1842, Mr. Adams spoke of his course concerning Texas. Having mentioned Mr. Van Buren's reply, declining the formal proposition made in 1837 by the Republic of Texas for annexation to the United States, he continued, quote, But the slave-breeding passion for the annexation was not to be so disconcerted. At the ensuing session of Congress, numerous petitions and memorials for and against the annexation were presented to the House, and were referred to the Committee on Foreign Affairs, who, without ever taking them into consideration, towards the close of the session, asked to be discharged from the consideration of them all. It was on this report that the debate arose, in which I disclosed the whole system of duplicity and perfidy towards Mexico, which has marked the Jackson administration from its commencement to its close. It silenced the clamors for the annexation of Texas to this Union for three years till the catastrophe of the Van Buren administration. The people of free states were lulled into the belief that the whole project was abandoned and that they should hear no more of slave trade cravings for the annexation of Texas. Had Harrison lived, they would have heard no more of them to this day, 
but no sooner was John Tyler installed in the president's house than nullification and Texas and war with Mexico rose again upon the surface, with eyes steadily fixed upon the polar star of southern slave-dealing supremacy in the government of the Union. End, quote. End of footnote 9. People sometimes took advantage of his avowed principles concerning freedom of petition to put him in positions which they thought would embarrass him or render him ridiculous. <laughs> not much success, however, attended these foolish efforts of shallow wits. It was not easy to disconcert him or to take him at disadvantage. July 28, 1841, he presented a paper of this character coming from sundry Virginians, and praying that all the free-colored population should be sold or expelled from the country. He simply stated as he handed in the sheet that nothing could be more abhorrent to him than this prayer, and that his respect for the right of petition was his only motive for presenting this. It was suspended under the gag rule, and its promoters, unless very easily amused, must have been sadly disappointed with the fate and effect of their joke. On March 5, 1838, he received from Rocky Mountain, Virginia, a letter and petition praying that the House would arraign at its bar and forever expel John Quincy Adams. He presented both documents with a resolution asking that they be referred to a committee for investigation and report. His enemies in the House saw that he was sure to have the best of sport if the matter should be pursued, and succeeded in laying it on the table. Waddy Thompson thoughtfully improved the opportunity to mention to Mr. Adams that he also had received a petition, quote, numerously signed, end quote, praying for Mr. Adams's expulsion, but had never presented it. In the following May, Mr. Adams presented another petition of like tenor. Dromgoole said he supposed it was a quiz, and that he would move to lay it on the table, quote, unless the gentleman from Massachusetts wished to give it another direction, end quote. Mr. Adams said that, quote, the gentleman from Massachusetts cared very little about it, end quote, and it found the limbo of the, quote, table, end quote. To this same period belongs the memorable tale of Mr. Adams's attempt to present a petition from slaves. On February 6, 1837, he brought in some 200 abolition petitions. He closed with one against the slave trade in the District of Columbia, purporting to be signed by, quote, nine ladies of Fredericksburg, Virginia, end quote, whom he declined to name because, as he said in the present disposition of the country, quote, he did not know what might happen to them if he did name them, end quote. Indeed, he added, he was not sure that the petition was genuine. He had said when he began to present his petitions that some among them were so peculiar that he was in doubt as to their genuineness, and this fell within the description. Apparently he had concluded, and was about to take his seat, when he quickly caught up another sheet, and said that he held in his hand a paper concerning which he should wish to have the decision of the speaker before presenting it. It purported to be a petition from twenty-two slaves, and he would like to know whether it came within the rule of the House concerning petitions relating to slavery. The Speaker, in manifest confusion, said that he could not answer the question until he knew the contents of the document. Mr. Adams, remarking that, quote, it was one of those petitions which had occurred to his mind as not being what it purported to be, end quote, proposed to send it up to the chair for inspection. Objection was made to this, and the Speaker said that the circumstances were so extraordinary that he would take the sense of the House. That body, at first inattentive, now became interested, and no sooner did a knowledge of what was going on spread among those present than great excitement prevailed. Members were hastily brought in from the lobbies. Many tried to speak, and from parts of the hall cries of, "'Expel him! Expel him!' were heard." For a brief interval, no one of the enraged Southerners was equal to the unforeseen emergency. Mr. Haynes moved the rejection of the petition. Mr. Lewis deprecated this motion, being of opinion that the House must inflict punishment on the gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Haynes thereupon withdrew a motion which was so obviously inadequate to the vindictive gravity of the occasion. Mr. Grantland stood ready to second a motion to punish Mr. Adams, and Mr. Lewis said that if punishment should not be meted out, it would, quote, be better for the representatives from the slave-holding states to go home at once, end quote. 
mr alford said that so soon as the petition should be presented he would move that it should quote, be taken from the house and burned at last mr thompson got a resolution into shape as follows quote, that the Honorable John Quincy Adams, by the attempt just made by him to introduce a petition purporting on its face to be from slaves, has been guilty of a gross disrespect to this house, and that he be instantly brought to the bar to receive the severe censure of the Speaker. End quote. In supporting this resolution, he said that Mr. Adams's action was in gross and willful violation of the rules of the House and an insult to its members. He even threatened criminal proceedings before the grand jury of the District of Columbia, saying that if that body had the, quote, proper intelligence and spirit, end quote, people might, quote, yet see an incendiary brought to condign punishment, end quote. Mr. Haynes, not satisfied with Mr. Thompson's resolution, proposed a substitute to the effect that Mr. Adams had, quote, rendered himself justly liable to the severest censure of this house and is censured accordingly end quote. then there ensued a little more excited speech-making and another resolution that mr adams quote, by his attempt to introduce into this house a petition from slaves for the abolition of slavery in the district of columbia has committed an outrage on the feelings of the people of a large portion of this union a flagrant contempt on the dignity of this house and by extending to slaves a privilege only belonging to freemen directly incites the slave population to insurrection and that the said member be forthwith called to the bar of the house and be censured by the speaker end quote. mr lewis remained of opinion that it might be best for the southern members to go home a proposition which afterwards drew forth a flaming speech from mr alford who far from inclining to go home was ready to stay quote, until this fair city is a field of waterloo and this beautiful potomac a river of blood end quote. mr patton of virginia was the first to speak a few words to bring members to their senses pertinently asking whether mr adams had quote, attempted to offer end quote, this petition and whether it did indeed pray for the abolition of slavery it might be well he suggested for his friends to be sure of their facts before going further then at last mr adams who had not at all lost his head in the general hurly-burly rose and said that amid these numerous resolutions charging him with quote, high crimes and misdemeanors end quote, and calling him to the bar of the house to answer for the same he had thought it proper to remain silent until the house should take some action that he did not suppose that if he should be brought to the bar of the house he should be quote, struck mute by the previous question end quote, before he should have been given an opportunity to quote, say a word or two end quote, in his own defence as to the facts quote, i did not present the petition he said and i appeal to the speaker to say that i did not i intended to take the decision of the speaker before i went one step towards presenting or offering to present that petition end quote. The contents of the petition, should the House ever choose to read it, he continued, would render necessary some amendments, at least in the last resolution, since the prayer was that slavery should not be abolished. End quote. The gentleman from Alabama may perchance find that the object of this petition is precisely what he desires to accomplish, and that these slaves who have sent this paper to me are his auxiliaries instead of being his opponents. End quote. These remarks caused some discomfiture among the Southern members, who were glad to have time for deliberation given them by a maundering speech from Mr. Mann of New York, who talked about, quote, the deplorable spectacle shown off every petition day by the honorable member from Massachusetts in presenting the abolition petitions of his infatuated friends and constituents, end quote, charged Mr. Adams with running counter to the sense of the whole country with a, quote, violence paralleled only by the revolutionary madness of desperation, end quote, and twitted him with his political friendlessness, with his age, and with the insinuation of waning faculties and judgment. This little file having been emptied, Mr. Thompson arose and angrily assailed Mr. Adams for contemptuously trifling with the house, which charge he based upon the entirely unproved assumption that the petition was not a genuine document. He concluded by presenting new resolutions better adapted to the recent development of the case. Quote, number one. 
that the honorable john quincy adams by an effort to present a petition from slaves has committed a gross contempt of this house number two that the member from massachusetts above named by creating the impression and leaving the house under such impression that the said petition was for the abolition of slavery when he knew that it was not has trifled with the house number three that the hon john quincy adams received the censure of the house for his conduct referred to in the preceding resolutions end quote. mr pinckney said the avowal by mr adams that he had in his possession the petition of slaves was an admission of communication with slaves and so was evidence of collusion with them and that mr adams had thus rendered himself indictable for aiding and abetting insurrection a fortiori then was he not amenable to the censure of the house mr haynes of georgia forgetting that the petition had not been presented announced his intention of moving that it should be rejected subject only to a permission for its withdrawal another member suggested that if the petition should be disposed of by burning it would be well to commit to the same combustion the gentleman who presented it on the next day some more resolutions were ready prepared by dromgoul who in his sober hours was regarded as the best parliamentarian in the southern party these were that mr adams quote, by stating in his place that he had in his possession a paper purporting to be a petition from slaves and inquiring if it came within the meaning of a resolution heretofore adopted as preliminary to its presentation has given color to the idea that slaves have the right of petition and of his readiness to be their organ and that for the same he deserves the censure of the house that the aforesaid john quincy adams receive a censure from the speaker in the presence of the house of representatives end, quote. end of chapter three c recording by tom geller oberlin ohio tomgeller.com Chapter 3D of John Quincy Adams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Cote. John Quincy Adams by John T. Morse. Chapter 3D. Mr. Alford, in advocating these resolutions, talked about this awful crisis of our beloved country. Mr. Robertson, though opposing the resolutions, took pains strongly to condemn the conduct of the gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Adams' colleague, Mr. Lincoln, spoke in his behalf, so also did Mr. Evans of Maine, and Caleb Cushing made a powerful speech upon his side. Otherwise than this, Mr. Adams was left to carry on the contest single-handed against the numerous array of assailants, all incensed, and many fairly savage. Yet it is a striking proof of the dread in which even the united body of hot-blooded Southerners stood of this hard fighter from the North, that as the debate was drawing to a close, after they had all said their say, and just before his opportunity came for making his elaborate speech of defense, they suddenly and opportunely became ready to content themselves with a mild resolution, which condemned generally the presentation of petitions from slaves, and, for the disposal of this particular case, recited that Mr. Adams had solemnly disclaimed all design of doing anything disrespectful to the House, and had avowed his intention not to offer to present to the House the petition of this kind held by him, that, therefore all further proceedings in regard to his conduct do now cease. A sneaking effort by Mr. Vanderpoel to close Mr. Adams' mouth by moving the previous question involved too much cowardice to be carried, and so on February 9 the sorely baited man was at last able to begin his final speech. He conducted his defense with singular spirit and ability, but at too great length to admit of even a sketch of what he said. He claimed the right of petition for slaves, and established it so far as argument can establish anything. He alleged that all he had done was to ask a question of the speaker, and if he was to be censured for so doing, then how much more, he asked, was the Speaker deserving of censure, who had even put the same question to the House, and given as his reason for so doing that it not only of novel but of difficult import. 
He repudiated the idea that any member of the House could be held by a grand jury to respond for words spoken in debate, and recommended the gentleman who had indulged in such preposterous threats to study a little the first principles of civil liberty, excoriating them until they actually arose and tried to explain away their own language. He cast infinite ridicule upon the unhappy expression of Dromgoul, giving color to an idea. Referring to the difficulty which he encountered by reason of the variety and disorder of the resolutions and charges against him, with which gentlemen from the South had pounced down upon him like so many eagles upon a dove, there was an exquisite sarcasm in the simile. He said, when I take up one idea, before I can give color to the idea, it has already changed its form and presents itself for consideration under other colors. What defense can be made against this new crime of giving color to ideas? As for the trifling with the House by presenting a petition, which in the course of debate had become pretty well known and acknowledged to be a hoax designed to lead Mr. Adams into a position of embarrassment and danger, he disclaimed any such motive, reminding members that he had given warning when beginning to present his petitions, that he was suspicious that some among them might not be genuine. Mr. Adams afterward said, I believed the petition signed by female names to be genuine. I had suspicions that the other, purporting to be from slaves, came really from the hand of a master who had prevailed on his slaves to sign it that they might have the appearance of imploring the members from the North to cease offering petitions for their emancipation, which could have no other tendency than to aggravate their servitude, and of being so impatient under the operation of petitions in their favor as to pray that the Northern members who should persist in presenting them should be expelled. It was a part of the prayer of the petition that Mr. Adams should be expelled if he should continue to present abolition petitions. But while denying all intention of trifling with the House, he rejected the mercy extended to him in the last of the long series of resolutions before that body. I disclaim not, he said, any particle of what I have done. Not a single word of what I have said do I unsay. Nay, I am ready to do and to say the same tomorrow. He had no notion of aiding in making a loophole through which his blundering enemies might escape, even though he himself should be accorded the privilege of crawling through it with them. At times during his speech there was a great agitation in the house, but when he closed no one seemed ambitious to reply. His enemies had learned anew a lesson, often taught to them before, and often to be impressed upon them again, that it was perilous to come to close quarters with Mr. Adams, they gave up all idea of censuring him, and were content to apply a very mild emollient to their own smarting wounds in the shape of a resolution, to the effect that slaves did not possess the right of petition, secured by the Constitution, to the people of the United States. In the winter of 1842 and 43, the questions arising out of the affair of the Creole rendered the position then held by Mr. Adams at the head of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs exceedingly distasteful to the slaveholders. On January 21st, 1842, a somewhat singular manifestation of this feeling was made when Mr. Adams himself presented a petition from Georgia praying for his removal from the chairmanship. Upon this he requested to be heard in his own behalf. The Southern Party, not sanguine of any advantage from debating the matter, tried to lay it on the table. The petition was alleged by Habersham of Georgia to be undoubtedly another hoax, but Mr. Adams, loath to lose a good opportunity, still claimed to be heard on the charges made against him by the infamous slaveholders, Mr. Smith of Virginia, said that the House had lately given Mr. Adams leave to defend himself against the charge of monomania, and asked whether he was doing so. Some members cried, Yes! Yes! Others shouted, No! He is establishing the fact! The wrangling was at last brought to an end by the Speaker's declaration that the petition must lie over for the present. But the scene had been only the prelude to one much longer 
fiercer, and more exciting. No sooner was the document thus temporarily disposed of than Mr. Adams rose and presented the petition of 45 citizens of Haverhill, Massachusetts, praying the House immediately to adopt measures peaceably to dissolve the union of these states for the alleged cause of the incompatibility between free and slaveholding communities. He moved its reference to a select committee with instructions to report an answer to the petitioners showing the reasons why the prayer of it ought not to be granted. In a moment, the house was aflame with excitement. The numerous members who had hated Mr. Adams thought that at last he was experiencing the divinely sent madness which foreruns destruction. Those who sought his political annihilation felt that the appointed and glorious hour of extinction had come. Those who had writhed beneath the castigation of his invective exulted in the near revenge. While one said that the petition should never have been brought within the walls of the house, and another wished to burn it in the presence of the members, Mr. Gilmer of Virginia offered a resolution that in presenting the petition Mr. Adams had justly incurred the censure of the house. Some objection was made to this resolution as not being in order, but Mr. Adams said that he hoped that it would be received and debated, and that an opportunity would be given him to speak in his own defense, especially as the gentleman from Virginia had thought proper to play second fiddle to his colleague, Henry A. Wise, from Accomac. Mr. Gilmer retorted that he played second fiddle to no man. He was no fiddler, but was endeavoring to prevent the music of him who, in the space of one revolving moon was statesman, poet, fiddler, and buffoon. The resolution was then laid on the table. The house rose, and Mr. Adams went home and noted in his diary, Evening in Meditation, for which indeed he had abundant cause. On the following day, Thomas F. Marshall of Kentucky offered a substitute for Gilmer's resolution. This new fulmination had been prepared in a caucus of forty members of the slaveholding party, and was long and carefully framed. Its preamble recited, in substance, that a petition to dissolve the Union, proposing to Congress to destroy that which the several members had solemnly and officially sworn to support, was a high breach of privilege, a contempt offered to this House, a direct proposition to the legislature, and each member of it to commit perjury, and involving necessarily in its execution and its consequences the destruction of our country and the crime of high treason. Wherefore it was to be resolved that Mr. Adams, in presenting a petition for dissolution, had offered the deepest indignity to the House, and an insult to the people, that if this outrage should be permitted to pass unrebuked and unpunished, he would have disgraced his country in the eyes of the whole world. That for this insult and this wound at the Constitution and existence of his country, the peace, the security, and liberty of the people of these states, he might well be held to merit expulsion from the national councils, and that the House deem it an act of grace and mercy when they only inflict upon him their severest censure. That so much they must do, for the maintenance of their own purity and dignity, for the rest they turned him over to his own conscience and the indignation of all true American citizens. These resolutions were then advocated by Mr. Marshall at great length and with extreme bitterness. Mr. Adams replied shortly, stating that he should wish to make his full defense at a later stage of the debate. Mr. Wise followed in a personal and acrimonious harangue. Mr. Everett, Horace Everett, of Vermont, gave some little assistance to Mr. Adams, and the House again adjourned. The following day, Wise continued his speech very elaborately. When he closed, Mr. Adams, who had determined not to interpret him till he had discharged his full cargo of filthy invective, rose to make a preliminary point. He questioned the right of the House to entertain Marshall's resolution, since the preamble assumed him to be guilty of the crimes of subordination, of perjury, and treason, and the resolutions themselves censured him as if he had been found guilty, whereas, in fact, 
he had not been tried upon these charges and of course had not been convicted if he was to be brought to trial upon them he asserted his right to have the proceedings conducted before a jury of his peers and that the house was not a tribunal having this authority but if he was to be tried for contempt for which alone he could lawfully be tried by the house still there were a hundred members sitting on its benches who were morally disqualified to judge him who could not give him an impartial trial because they were prejudiced and the question was one on which their personal pecuniary and most sordid interests were at stake such considerations he said ought to prevent many gentlemen from voting as mr wise had avowed that they would prevent him here wise interrupted to disavow that he was influenced by any such reasons but rather he said by the personal loathing dread and contempt i feel for the man mr adams continuing after this pleasant interjection admitted that he was in the power of the majority who might try him against law and condemn him against right if they would if they say they will try me they must try me if they say they will punish me they must punish me but if they say that in peace and mercy they will spare my expulsion i disdain and cast away their mercy and i ask them if they will come to such a trial and expel me i defy them i have constituents to go to who will have something to say if this house expels me nor will it be long before the gentlemen will see me here again such was the fierce temper and indomitable courage of this inflexible old man he flung contempt in the face of those who had him wholly in their power and in the same breath in which he acknowledged that power he dared them to use it he charged wise with the guilt of innocent blood in connection with certain transactions in a duel and exasperated that gentleman into crying out that the charge made by the gentleman from massachusetts was as base and black a lie as the traitor was base and black who uttered it when he was asked by the speaker to put his point of order in writing his own request to the like effect in another case having been refused shortly before he tauntingly congratulated that gentleman upon his discovery of the expediency of having points of order reduced to writing a favor which he had repeatedly denied to me when mr wise was speaking i interrupted him occasionally says mr adams sometimes to provoke him into absurdity as usual he was left to fight out his desperate battle substantially single-handed only mr everett occasionally helped him a very little while one or two others who spoke against the resolutions were careful to explain that they felt no personal good will towards mr adams but he faced the odds courageously it was no new thing for him to be pitted alone against a solid south outside the walls of the house he had some sympathy and some assistance tendered him by individuals among others by rufus choate then in the senate and by his own colleagues from massachusetts the support aided and cheered him somewhat but could not prevent substantially the whole burden of the labor and brunt of the contest from bearing upon him alone among the external manifestations of feeling those of hostility were naturally largely in the ascendant the newspapers of washington the globe and the national intelligencer which reported the debates daily filled their columns with all the abuse and invective which was poured forth against him while they gave the most meagre statements or none at all of what he said in his own defense among other amenities he received from north carolina an anonymous letter threatening him with assassination having also an engraved portrait of him with the mark of a rifle ball in the forehead and the motto to stop the music of john quincy adams etc etc this missive he read and displayed in the house but it was received with profound indifference by men who would not have greatly objected to the execution of the barbarous threat the prolonged struggle cost him deep anxiety and sleepless nights which in the declining years of a laborious life told hardly upon his aged frame but against all odds of numbers and under all disadvantages of circumstances the past repeated itself and mr adams alone won a victory over all the cohorts of the south 
Several attempts had been made during the debate to lay the whole subject on the table. Mr. Adams said that he would consent to this simply because his defense would be a very long affair, and he did not wish to have the time of the House consumed and the business of the nation brought to a stand solely for the consideration of his personal affairs. These propositions failing, he began his speech, and soon was making such headway that even his adversaries were constrained to see that the opportunity which they had conceived to be within their grasp was eluding them as had so often happened before. Accordingly, on February 7, the motion to lay the whole subject on the table forever was renewed and carried by 106 votes to 93. The House then took up the original petition and refused to receive it by 166 to 40. No sooner was this consummation reached than the irrepressible champion rose to his feet and proceeded with his budget of anti-slavery petitions, of which he presented nearly two hundred till the House adjourned. Within a very short time, there came further and convincing proof that Mr. Adams was victor. On February 26, he writes, D. D. Barnard told me he had received a petition from his district, signed by a small number of very respectable persons, praying for a dissolution of the Union. He said he did not know what to do with it, I dined with him. By March 14, this dinner bore fruit. Mr. Bernard had made up his mind what to do with it. He presented it with a motion that it be referred to a select committee with instructions to report adversely to its prayer. The well-schooled house now took the presentation without a ripple of excitement and was content with simply voting not to receive the petition. End of chapter 3D Recording by Tim Cote.